Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Anastasios Papayuanu. I'm the e-research training manager and lead research data scientist at Intersect. And I would like to welcome you to Intersect Australia Research Technology Webinar Series that is supported by RNET. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people uh, today. Um, also, I would like to thank um, Arnett for supporting Intersect in delivering these webinars. Um, as they say to us, it fits with their vision of accelerating knowledge and creation and innovation to, benef to benefit future generations of Australia. So thanks a lot for supporting these webinars and make it widely open. Okay, a few things before we start. Today I have with me Malcolm Ramsey, uh, the presenter of this webinar and the creator of this webinar, and Charlotte Francois, who will moderate the webinar with me. So Charlotte and Malcolm, would you like to introduce yourselves? Well, thanks Anastasios. Yeah, hi, I'm Malcolm. Um, I've just finished a, a PhD in computational chemistry uh, where I've used these tools um, all throughout my PhD. Um, and so hopefully I can impart some of the knowledge um, of how you can use them effectively um, within your own research. Uh, I'm also the um, e-research training uh, administrator um, with Intersect and conduct a lot of the training um, that, we, that we do. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh Cool. So hi everyone, my name is Charlotte. I'm the uh, e-research analyst at La Trobe University. I'm also currently working on finishing my PhD in the field of beneficial plant microbe interactions in soil. Thanks Charlotte. So just a quick introduction uh, about Intersect. Um, Intersect is a non-for-profit membership based e-research organization that operates across five states and territories. Uh, it was formed in 2008 by New South Wales universities and governed by a consortium of 13 Australian universities at the moment, uh, which are our members. We provide universities and their researchers uh, advice on the use of research in, uh, of technology in research. We also provide training in research technology tools and we develop high quality software for research use cases. Here you can see all our members. Most of them are from New South Wales, and but also we have um, other universities in Victoria, ACT, and South Australia. This is our model, and I would like to to quickly discuss what's happening here. So the research analysts uh, are the primary interface between uh, Intersect and member organizations, as Charlotte, for example, for Latrobe. They're based on campus at the member university and work in conjunction with the support framework of the member university. Uh, this slide also facilitates the cross-institutional collaboration with the research analysts, helping each other with shared problems. So the responsibilities of the ERAs are to provide advice, to gather research-specific IT requirements, help guide the development and deployment of uh, relevant e-research services, and also increase the visibility and acceptance of good research practices. So training is uh, one of our main services uh, and we provide training on various uh, research technologies uh, delivered in both in person and online nowadays. Our interactive hands-on training is designed to improve research productivity and support world-class research by imparting key research skills and support um, to researchers. So since our inception in 2008, we have delivered over 1,300 courses and we have trained over 17,000 researchers across 13 member universities and research organizations. So this new uh, fully open research technology webinar series that is suitable for HDR students, re researchers and professional staff commenced in July. The first webinar was start coding without hesitation, Python, R, MATLAB, and Julia. So it was an introduction in all these programming languages just to compare them. And we have also some upcoming uh, webinars um, in the next few months, which, is, which are the survey tools in research, RedCup vs Qualtrics, then research computing, high performance computing vs cloud computing, and another one, which is the thinking like a computer, the fundamentals of programming. 
So you can find all these in our website. So if I click here, it's gonna open our website. And you can see here our course catalog and in the level we have all our webinars. So if you would like to check all these webinars and when they're, they're scheduled, you can go to our website and you can click and register. So at the moment, we don't have a date yet for the next um, upcoming course uh, webinars, but we're gonna have soon. And after this, I would like to, uh, Malcolm to start the presentation and everybody to enjoy the data analysis in Python and R. Cool. Thank you, Anastasios. Uh, now, before I get into the, the data analysis part, I just want to make it clear that I'm not an expert in public health or coronavirus. There's no public health or anything um, advice that I'm going to be giving. Um, however, I am an expert in the data analysis and the, the training. And so I can impart some of the knowledge um, today in how you can improve some of your um, data analysis techniques uh, and some of the tools that we'll be using. Uh, now, a common request uh, that we get when we are conducting our training courses um, is to use a data set that um, the attendees are familiar with uh, and that is sort of from specific research areas. Uh, and so throughout the coronavirus um, pandemic, um, this figure from um, John Burr Murdoch at the Financial Times is one that I found really useful for, for tracking and very informative. Uh, and so throughout today, we're going to be looking at how we can take some data set uh, and reproduce bits of this figure. Um, we won't get all of the way um, because limited by time, um, but showing some of how we can, uh, how we can get there. Um, so the main ideas um, that we're going to be presenting today um, normally take um, a full day in both R and Python. Um, so it's going to be very condensed. Uh, and so there's the five main topics um, that I'm going to be introducing. Um, so the first one is data frames and how we can use them to manipulate data. Uh, we'll be looking at pipelines, which is um, taking a series of steps and describing that within the code. Uh, we've also got the idea of split, apply, combine, where we divide a data set into smaller groups, um, operate on those uh, smaller elements and then combine them back together. Uh, and then looking at uh, visualizing using the grammar of graphics uh, and finally um, merging data frames together. Uh, so we'll show example. I'll show examples in both uh, Python and R. Um, so you'll get to see see this in two different ways. Uh, by using these two different languages, what we'll see is that these ideas transcend the particular programming language um, that they're implemented in, uh, and sort of a wider applicability in you know all kinds of visualization and analysis tools. Um, and um, so you're able to actually, uh, what we've done, um, we'll make books um, that, I, that I generate um, at the end of the course. Uh, and if you do want more information about the training, uh, we'll provide this uh, at the end of this. Uh, now, so that I can have everything uh, in a single view, um, on the left-hand side, I've got my Python notebook. Uh, on my right-hand side, I've got my R notebook. And so this is uh, the Jupyter Lab interface um, through Cloud Store Swan. So this is one of the services that Arnet provides, uh, and it's a really useful way to interrogate some research data uh, and and make it uh, available. Okay, so the main tool that we'll be using for our data analysis is the data frame. Uh, so within R, uh, this is a, a data set or data type that is, is native to the language. Um, however, we're going to be using a, a couple of packages to help us uh, provide some of the useful tools that we'll be working with today. Um, so in particular, we're using the dplyr library, um, which allows for the manipulation of our data sets, uh, as well as the lubridate uh, library, uh, which provides some utilities for working with dates. Uh, and so that's one of, one of our axes. Um, that's what we'll be, that's what we're using there. Uh, the final package we're using in R is the ggplot2 library. Uh, now this is what it is, is the gold standard um, in terms of uh, visualization libraries across you know, everything. Um, and so uh, we'll be using that within R. Uh, on the Python side of things, uh, we're using the pandas library, uh, which provides the data frames as well as all of the utilities um, that go along with it. Uh, and then for the visualization, we're using the Seaborn library, uh, which contains um, 
all our grammar of graphics type interface um, for Python. Now, to be able to actually, you know, data frame, we need to load it up with some data. Uh, so the, for the COVID-19 um, is sourced from the, the John Hopkins um, Museum University Center for System Science. And it's a fairly widely used um, data set. Um, so this is the, the page. Uh, we're using a slightly modified version, uh, which contains a CSV file that makes it a lot easier for us to, to work with. Um, so that's the, the data set that we're using in um, both cases. Um, we're also having a look at uh, the Gapminder data set, which provides some information um, about the continents for each country, uh, as well as GDP per capita, um, life expectancy, uh, and other types of information about all the countries. Um, and so we, um, using this, we'll be using it a little bit later in the session. Um, and it's the data set that we use in a lot of our training. Okay. So to um, create our data sets, um, I've already put in all of the URLs um, and so I don't have to and make some typos there. Um, so I've just loaded them into both uh, Python and uh, R. Now there's, um, all right, so just a, a quick note here, um, prefaced all of my variables here are DF. Uh, now, one of the nice things about the R Studio is that it gives you a list of all environment variables. Um, in this case, uh, if I start typing DF uh, and then press the tab, I get all of the data frames that I have created. So it's a, a nice, useful tool there. So now I've loaded up um, our data set. The first thing we want to do is have a look at the structure. Um, for within R, this is using the, the STR, which is short for structure. And this will give us information about all of the columns with data frame. Um, so the date, country, dot region, province, state, uh, as well as some others. Uh, additionally, it gives us information on the type of data that's stored. So here the CHR is short for character, which is our text, um, some text data. Uh, and then we've got numerical, which is um, number with a decimal point and an integer type, so a whole number. Uh, so there's a few things that we want to do with this um, data frame before we get to um, actually generating some, some figures. Uh, first thing we want to do is to change our date um, from a text field to a date field. And this is so that uh, R can understand um, each of these as a date and we can look at things like what day of the week or how many days between uh, two dates. And uh, so using the LubriDate package, we're able to do that. Um, we also uh, don't need these latitude and longitude columns. Okay, so for what we're doing today, uh, we can get rid of them, uh, which we'll be doing. Uh, and then also this country, region, province, state, those names are long um, and they're going to be, we're going to say that they're different. Uh, so what to do is normalize them to country and state. Um, so they're what they're the step going to be uh, getting to. Um, but before we do that, we're going to have a you know look and compare it our data set within Python. Uh, so the equivalent uh, function um, within Python is to use the info uh, function, which uh, comes after the data, um, the data frame. So there's this slight difference in the way that we operate with a data frame between Python and R, uh, but we'll see that they do look very similar um, when we introduce uh, the pipelines. Uh, and so we get the information, um, again, the names, the types of data. Um, here, object means it's a string or text data. Uh, and we also have our floating point values. Uh, in this case, um, all of them are floating point, And that's just a, a limitation of pandas and its um, handling of missings. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is go through our, um, firstly, to drop these uh, unneeded columns. Uh, so we can take our um, broad data frame uh, and if we use the drop function, uh, we need to specify the columns that we're going to drop. We can use the square brackets to generate a list. Uh, and what this does is it basically tricks us into thinking that we've got a single element uh, when we're specifying two different columns. Okay, so I'm specifying the latitude and the longitude column uh, and that removes the columns from our resulting data frame. The, um, so to save this, what we need to do is to assign this to a uh, variable. So I'm going to use the DF COVID to keep track of our progress as we work through. 
Uh, so moving back over to the R side of things, um, we've got a slightly different way in which we can um, remove or drop um, columns within R. Uh, now R has this uh, ability um, that we do a negative selection. Uh, so what this means is you can select everything except uh, the columns to file. Um, so using the minus sign, uh, C here is the same idea as the collecting um, items together, sort of tricking it into um, being a single item. Uh, we can find the latitude and the longitude. Uh, now you'll notice that um, unlike Python, where we need the double quotes around everything, um, we don't need that within R. Um, and now this is sort of, you know, there's some complex things going on here. These things, uh, the not having the quotes makes things a little bit nicer, um, but it does uh, run into some, it can be some issues of um, inconsistencies between different functions within R. Um, but it is quite nice that we don't have to do that. Uh, so again, this gives us the, the six columns rather than the eight total. Uh, and we can assign this to our DF COVID uh, variable. Okay. Um, so having a look, We've now you know, get rid of those um, data frame or those extra columns. What we need to do now is to rename uh, the couple of columns uh, that we have. Uh, so we have uh, within R this rename function. Uh, and what we can do here is we can pass the name of our uh, data frame. So the, our COVID, DF COVID. Uh, and then we can um, break this up into a couple of lines. So it can be easier to, uh, you know, the names of these can get very long. Um, so anything in between these parentheses can split into multiple lines. Uh, and this holds in both Python and R. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is um, the names of the that I want are the uh, country and the state. And I'm going to assign to each of those uh, the existing name uh, that the column had. Uh, so we're setting. Uh, the new names, country and state, from the existing columns, the country.region and the province, uh, where is it, province.state. Okay, so now that data frame has those renamed, uh, renamed columns, uh, I can assign that result to the DF COVID. All right, and we can do a very similar thing uh, within pandas. So the DF COVID, um, and we've got a uh, re rename function. Um, for this one, we need to specify that we're renaming a column. Um, so I'm going to use the, the columns here. And there's a slightly different uh, way of doing this renaming. Um, so within Python, uh, we specify the existing name that we have. Uh, in this case, it's country slash region. And we map that um, using this dictionary uh, to the new um, to the new name, which is country. Uh, so we're, this is a replacing any time we see country region uh, with country. Uh, and we can do a similar thing with the province slash state. Uh, and to state. Um, so the squiggly braces. Uh, we're creating a dictionary, which is it's kind of like a, um, a or a, a mapping of one value to another. And uh, so we're replacing uh, the country region with country. Uh, and so that gives us our uh, replaced values there. Uh, and so in doing that, I can update my uh, DF COVID variable. Okay, it's covered the two of the, the different uh, modifications we wanted to make here. Um, the final one is converting our date column um, to a date that the computer or Python or R can understand and operate with. Uh, so to do this, we need to firstly select uh, the date column. Uh, so within pandas, we can do that um, using the square brackets here. Uh, so that will just give us the date column uh, and all of the values with uh, to convert this to a, uh, a date, uh, we need to use from the pandas library uh, the to date time function. And automatically uh, detect uh, the type 
or the format of the date that we have. So the year, the month, and the day. Uh, and then it converts it to a data type of a date time. Um, so we have this, this date time object. Uh, and if we wanted to do um, so date time dot, um, oh, I can't remember what it is. Uh, look at the, the, the day of the week. Um, we can use dot days uh, and that'll tell us Uh, no, it's not days. Oh, dot day name. Um, we can get the day name um, of each of these days. Um, that's not something we're going to do, but to sort of demonstrate how we might want to look at a date um, type rather than a text. Uh, and so what we'll then need to do is to update our um, DF COVID data set. Uh, now, we only want to update the date column. Um, so by selecting that column, assigning the updated values, um, what we now have is our um, COVID uh, column. Uh, and if I look at the information, um, the data there is a, a date time uh, object. Okay. Uh, so what we can do is the same thing for R. Um, only there's a slightly, well, slightly different way of uh, adding a column um, of our data set. Uh, and that's using the dollar sign. Um, so that gives us the dollar sign and then the name of the column uh, will give us the, the date column here. Uh, now within the Lubridate package, uh, there's this uh, function year, month, day or YMD, uh, which converts a date format year, month and day uh, into a uh, date um, that R understands uh, and we can then use that within the data set. Uh, so I can assign that uh, just like in Python uh, back to that date column uh, to update it. And again looking at the structure of that data set um, or DF COVID um, the date is now a, a date um, value rather than a character. All right, so I defined um, all of these uh, different steps, um, but we still have a little bit of a uh, um, problem here in that if I look at the, the data set, um, I have, well, um, well, what is this, this state thing, right? Um, so Currently, uh, I only want to plot a value for each country on each day. Right? I don't particularly care about um, the breakdown of states. And for some countries, there's lots of states and others, there's not so many. Uh, and so what I want to be able to do is only look at countries, or only look at a single value for each country. Um, so I need to use this split apply can, um, split uh, values up um, by the date and the, and the country um, so that for every day, I only end up, only want to end up with one value um, for each country. So as an example, I can um, select just the last day. Um, so if I filter um, our uh, data frame, our COVID data frame, and I want to select the date where the date is equal to the maximum of that column. Uh, and so what I'm doing here is only seeing the dates where we compare uh, that with the, the maximum. Okay, and so that gives me um, all the values for the, the 9th of um, August. So that's a couple of days ago, I think. Uh, so we've got some very up-to-date data, which is one of the nice things about using those URLs. Um, so if we have a look at Australia here, uh, we've got all of the, the different states and territories of Australia. Uh, and what we need to do is to sum up all of the cases uh, within Australia. Uh, so we can see that there's um, each of these are individually broken out and we want to sum them all up a single value for Australia. Uh, so as a, um, well, to sort of check and work, check and check that this works, we could select only the, the values for Australia. Um, but what, a little problem here is that um, we've got all of the, uh, well, we're taking a data set or data frame 
uh, converting it into another data, and we want to then you know, keep working on that, which is a really common idea um, within both Python and R. Uh, and within Python, we've got this, uh, this dot, right? It's this dot rename, and it gives us back a dot um, that we can then use to, to keep modifying. Uh, within uh, R, we can do a similar thing uh, with the pipe symbol. Uh, and that is the percent greater than percent. So what this does is it takes our COVID data frame and uses it as the input for the filter. And then we can use um, the output of filter and use it as the input to um, another filter where we look for the, the country or country column is equal to Australia. So we're only getting the values for Australia. Okay, so this gets us to the, the idea um, where we're sort of filtered here. We want to be able to sum up these values. Um, but we want to do it for every value of the date and for every value of the country. Uh, so to do that, we need to use this idea of the split appliance. So splitting our data set so that um, every day is separated and every country is separated. And we can do that um, very easily with this pipeline um, using the, um, the group by function. So the group by, uh, we pass to that, actually I'm going to split this up into a couple of lines. Uh, we can pass to that the columns that we want to group our data set by. Um, so the date is the first one. So we have a value for each day. Uh, and the other one is the country. Uh, and what this gives us is, uh, it's a grouped data frame. Um, but what we then need to do is to um, take those groups and perform some kind of, of function on them. And the we're going to look at um, is the sum function. Uh, but to sort of apply that, we need to summarize um, our summarize each of the columns. Um, so within R, we use the summarize function um, to define how we do that, uh, that uh, aggregation, the combining. Uh, and in this case, I want to create um, three columns, uh, the confirmed, uh, which is going to be the sum of um, the confirmed. Um, so this is sum over all of the different states. Uh, we've got a recovered, which is going to be the sum of the recovered, and the deaths, uh, which is going to be the sum of the deaths. Okay, so now for each day, uh, we only have a single value for each country um, rather than uh, broken up into each of the states. All right. And we can assign that back to our COVID um, data set. Okay, so that same idea is also applicable to, to Python, right? Um, and I sort of use that as the, the um, example here in that we're taking our, um, our data set, applying an operation, getting a data set back, and so we can continue to apply those operations. Uh, so within Python, we've got a similar idea. We can take our, our COVID data set, um, use the dot group by function, um, in this case, we've got to use the square brackets again to convince that Python that the two columns that we're providing um, are actually sort of one thing. Um, so the date and the country. And this will give us this, this pandas group by. Uh, and what this is sort of telling us is that there's no sensible way to display these um, individual groups um, of, of data. And so what we do uh, is to apply the sum function to them uh, to get that those values back. Now, within um, Python, these bold uh, values on the left-hand side, uh, they're called the index. And we don't want them uh, within, our, uh, within this particular analysis. Uh, and so I have to as index to false. Uh, so I just get a table of data back. Uh, and so this is what we're going to be uh, working with uh, today. Uh, finally, I can assign this now to a bool, oh, back to our COVID variable. Uh, and in doing so, you'll notice that we're taking up um, what well, goes off the age. Uh, and so unlike R, where I can just sort of put this pipe symbol and it'll continue on the next line, 
Uh, with Python, I can use the, the open parentheses to create this group. Um, so split up each of these uh, steps into its own line, uh, giving us sort of that same idea as with R. And so there's this you know, slight um, difference, but we can still work or do the same sequence of steps uh, within both languages. Okay, so we've seen all of these visual steps uh, to generate our data set. And what we do want to be able to do is, you know, tomorrow, once that's updated, um, we want to sort of you know, update the value. Um, or if we accidentally mess something up in one of these intermediate steps, uh, we then have to go back through and do all of it at once. So wouldn't it be nice to have all of these steps that we've done, right? The um, uh, redropping columns, renaming, uh, converting to dates, uh, and then this, this group by and sequence in one cell can run uh, and update our values. Uh, so what we're going to do is combine all of these together. Uh, and so we're going to start, I'm going to start parentheses. Um, within Python, there's going to be a number of steps. Uh, and within that, we're going to start with our raw data set and go through the sequence um, all at once. Uh, so we can use the, uh, well, firstly, we'll do the drop. Uh, so drop our columns, uh, which will be the uh, latitude and longitude columns, uh, which gives us, um, gives us our data set there. So at each step, checking that it works. Uh, we can then use our rename uh, of the columns uh, to rename the uh, uh, the country region to country. If I can spell that correctly. And our province step to the state. Okay, check that works. Um, and we've got our data set there. Uh, the next one was to replace the date uh, column with one that is uh, under the date. And so this one's, a uh, we've got to do a little bit of a different way of um, working with our data set um, within. Uh, and so this is Lambda thing is uh, it's called an anonymous function. Lambda. So, yeah, that's all right. Uh, and so what it allows us to do is modify this data set in place. Uh, and so I can use the pandas dot two date time with the, uh, the date column. Um, and so this allows me to take the input. So the, the renamed data set uh, and use it as the input to this, uh, the two date time function. Um, so now our um, date times have been, or the date has been converted. Uh, the next step is to do our uh, group by. Uh, so again, using the, the square braces to um, combine two elements into a single group by. And we need to specify the as index is false. And finally, the sum. So that's all of the steps that we've performed uh, on this data set. Uh, and so I can now assign this to my DF COVID uh, and all of the steps uh, that are required um, to take our raw data set and convert to our processed one are uh, documented uh, in, these, in these lines. Uh, we can also add comments at each line to indicate um, uh, you know, why we're doing each of these steps. Uh, but for time purposes, I'm going to sort of leave that um, Leave that. So um, just like we've done in Python, we can use the same lines uh, within R. Okay. And so the starting with our raw data set and piping it to our, um, in this case, uh, we instead of drop, we're using the select function uh, with the negative indexing to describe the values that we're dropping. Um, so selecting everything except these. Uh, we can then use uh, um, or it's the rename rename uh, to take our um, or to define the new names of the columns. Uh, so the continent, uh, which is going to be the uh, 
continent dot, um, and I can't remember the name of that column, so I'm just going to df a region. Oh, why did it do that? Oh, country, yeah, country. And country dot region, and then the other one being the state is the province. Okay, check that works. Um, so there's our, our selection and our rename. Uh, for the um, modification of the date, uh, we have a, a nicer um, weight within R, and that's the mutate function. And that allows us to take or assign to um, a new column um, the year, month, and day of the column. Okay. Um, so that's how we can mutate. Oh, I missed the percent. Uh, that's how we can mutate the date to become a date column there. Uh, the final step is going to be the, um, the group by. Uh, so if I, um, so here we want to um, have a, only a single value for each country and each uh, each day. Uh, so we're grouping by the date and the country uh, using our summarize function, which I'm going to copy from here. Oh, copy. Uh, to finish up that pipeline. Okay, so again, all of those steps documented in a single uh, cell, uh, DF COVID. Okay, so that's how we can take a data set and perform that cleaning up operation. Um, and what we now want to do is to um, plot that data and, and make it usable. Um, so within this, we, well, to do this, uh, we're going to be using the ggplot2 or ggplot library. Uh, and so to create uh, a, a plot with ggplot, uh, we start by specifying the data set. Uh, and so I'm in the, the COVID data set that I just created and cleaned up. Uh, and then we specify the aesthetics. Um, so these define how we take the columns of the data that we have and uh, represent it on the figure uh, that, we're, that we have. Uh, and so on the x-axis, I want to use the date column. Uh, and y-axis, I want to use the confirmed column. Uh, now, I have a line for every country. And it doesn't make sense to use um, a color to represent every, every different country, right? It's going to be nonsense. Um, so what I'm going to do is use the group. Um, so this draws a line for every country. So similar to the group by operation. Now, when I plot with ggplot, um, uh, performing this, uh, just the aesthetics, I get defigured. So the aesthetics draw um, the axes, uh, but they don't draw the data. Uh, and so we need a separate specification or a separate layer uh, to tell ggplot how we want to draw our, um, our data. Uh, and in this case, I want to use a line uh, to draw the data. And that gives me a line to these values uh, on the figure. All right, so within um, Python, the Seaborn um, package provides a very similar interface to, to this ggplot. Uh, and so we have our sns.rel um, plot uh, to plot a relationship between two continuous variables, which is what we have here. Uh, to our rel plot, we, take, we also have our um, data. Um, so we specify the data set that we're using. Um, so just like ggplot, and then just like ggplot, uh, we specify the columns or how we represent our columns of data. Um, so the date is uh, represented on the x-axis uh, and the confirm on the y-axis, we represent the confirmed. Uh, now there's a slight, uh, well, uh, we can then tell it, hey, I want a line plot. Uh, so it's slightly different in that regards. Uh, if we do this, it'll by default aggregate all of the different countries into a single value. Um, so in this case, we get a, a single line with some error bars. Uh, we, in this case, we don't. Uh, 
Uh, and so we have to do a similar thing to this group over in R. Uh, so I use the units is the country and I then need to set the estimator, which is how we estimate the mean and the, the um, errors uh, to none uh, so that we know try and generate those values. Uh, and that gives the, the you know, equivalent plot to the ggplot. Okay, so this idea of um, taking a column and representing it um, using one of the, um, the axes of a plot uh, is this idea of graphics uh, and we can build up very complex figures doing that. Okay, so we've got um, all of these plots, but what we want to do is to, you know, make it a little bit more understandable. Uh, and this is where the Gapminder information comes in. Uh, so the particular fear interested uh, Gapminder is the continent. Okay, and from this, we're able to take our uh, country um, from our um, COVID data set and map it to the con in the uh, Gapminder data set. So there, we've got these two values and we want to merge them together. And so the, what to look at now can combine these two data sets together. Uh, so firstly, we need to do a little bit of cleaning um, of our Gapminder raw data set. Uh, so the first thing is going to be to rename the consonant, or rename a couple of um, columns. Uh, so I'm going to rename the country to be the capitalized version. So it's the same in both data. I'm also going to rename the consonant uh, to the capitalized continent. And this is mostly for consistency here. Uh, the other thing I want to do is to uh, only select the last um, data set. Um, so in this case, I can select the year is equal to the year dot max. Um, so using the query here, you can only select the year 2007, which is happens to be the last um, year in the data set. And then I'm going to drop that year column. Okay, so now I only have those five columns. And that'll give me my DF Gapminder data set. Okay, starting with the pipelines. Um, so we can do the same thing um, within, within R, right? Take our, our raw data set. Um, we're going to rename, um, rename our columns, uh, taking the, in this case, we've got to switch it around. So we're taking, creating the column country uh, from the previous column of country and the creating the column consonant from our previous column there. All right. Uh, and then uh, again, we can um, use a, um, what's the function again? Uh, we can use the filter uh, to do what we've done with the query. Um, so select the, call it the value of year um, such that it's equal to the maximum um, of the year. And the final step is to drop or select everything except that final minus year, uh, that value of year, column of year. We don't need it anymore. Uh, and I'm going to assign that to the Okay, so now we've got those two, two data frames. What we want to be able to do is to merge them together or combine them together. Now, the, this is a, um, the, well, this theory comes from databases. Uh, and so within R, uh, we use the inner join, uh, which defines um, the it's sort of name comes from uh, databases. Uh, and so we're going to use that uh, to um, join these two data sets together. Uh, actually, now one thing I've forgotten to do is that there's a slight mismatch uh, in values uh, within these data sets. Uh, in particular, uh, the US is um, in the Gapminder is United States and in COVID it's US. Uh, and so what I do as a final step here is to um, use this mutate function uh, to replace values of country um, 
where the United States is the US. Um, so taking using the replace function to take in the column country um, where the values of country are equal to United States. I want to replace them with US. So I'm just going to put that on a couple of lines so we can that all goes together. And I'll have to do the same thing within Python. Um, so for this inner join function, uh, we can take our DF COVID data set and our Gapminder data set. And we need to specify how we join them together. Uh, and so we've got this country, right? And that's the same in both data sets. We want to take our or add the continent information to our COVID um, data set. Uh, so now when we join them together, uh, in addition to the country and all the COVID data, we also get that um, Gapminder population and continent. Uh, and there's also, if it will scroll over, the life expectancy and the GDP per capita. Um, so we're combining those data sets together. Uh, and I'm going to call that um, DF merged. Uh, and that's going to be our, um, our combined data set. Uh, so before I do the, the merging uh, within Python, uh, we can do a similar thing uh, in replacing the values of the United States with US. Uh, and there's a replace function that's going to do exactly that. Um, so like the rename, um, it takes a mapping, so a dictionary, um, which maps the uh, existing value, United States, to the new value, which is US. And that updates that. Uh, now, um, the naming of this, this merging uh, pandas is, well, I've used the name merge because I, I am more, f use pandas more. Um, uh, but it's the same as the inner join. Um, so we specify the DF COVID, um, the DF Gapminder, and then we, rather than by, we use the on. Um, so slight difference in naming here. Uh, and we merge them to, can I get an error? And I oh, merge on country, not continent. Uh, and that combines those together. Um, so I will note that um, there is a function in pan, uh, but it's not quite the same as the same as the inner join within R. Okay, so now we've combined all of our data together. Uh, we can incorporate some of that Gapminder information uh, into our um, sort of final plot that we're going to finish up with today. Uh, so we're going to um, use the same the same plot as we had previously. So this relational plot uh, and define our data set being our uh, merged data set. Uh, we can specify the x axis being the date, uh, the y axis being the confirmed cases. Uh, Additionally, we're going to combine the hue, um, which is another way of saying color, um, as the continent. Uh, so this means every continent is going to have a slightly different color um, within our resulting figure. Uh, we then need to say, tell Seaborn, hey, I want a line plot. Um, so the kind is line. Uh, and we need to do that um, thing with the units ago, set the units to be the country and the estimator is none. Okay, and that gives us um, all of the different continents colored differently. Uh, now it would be remiss of me to um, not put this on a, uh, a log scale, um, since this is probably one of the graphs that sort of made a log scale widely log, um, or exponential uh, growth, you know, widely known. Um, and so if I put that on the log scale, I get the figure. Okay. Uh, and we can do the same thing um, within R um, using the ggplot. So if I specify in ggplot um, our data set, which is our merged, get mine to merged, um, our aesthetics, um, which our X is going to be the date, the Y is the confirmed, the color is going to be the continent. And let's split this up. 
and the continent and the group is going to be the country. Uh, which creates all the axes, but we need to give it the um, tell it plot. Um, so we use the geom uh, line to plot the line. And finally, um, the figure. Um, so finally, again, we want to put it on a log scale. Uh, and so we can use set uh, y um, uh, log 10. Uh, or scale y log 10. Uh, and so we get the equivalent figure within ggplot there. Okay. Uh, so that takes us through a sort of a whirlwind tour of how we can use um, years of, uh, of data frames, right? Our pipelines, the Sly combine, um, our grammar of graphics in creating our, our plots and then the, the merging data set frames together um, to do a complex um, data analysis you know, on, a, on a data set. Um, now this is just you know, the start, right? There's so much more you could do with this, um, including um, setting reference times based on you know, how many cases, um, which I would have loved to do, but there's obviously not enough time um, so hopefully you've seen how um, these ideas, they transcend it, right? We're doing the same operations um, in, both, uh, in both programming languages uh, and it's a, it's a really good way to sort of see that. Now, if you are interested uh, in learning more about um, data analysis and visualization in uh, either R or Python, um, please feel free to get in touch. Um, so the details to do that are um, up on the screen now and we would be happy to uh, take you through. Um, so at this point, I think there are a few questions and so I'm happy to take those. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, if you can, so again, Arnett to just give a quick intro to Schwann and everything like um, the Arnett slide, Malcolm. So just to acknowledge again, Arnett for helping us, um, supporting us in this webinar series and it wouldn't be possible to have it without them. And also thanks Malcolm for using one of their services. So which is Swan. Um, so Arnett is providing these to all people who are um, like the, their institutions are part of uh, the Arnett network. So if you are from a, a university or an organization that is using Arnet, you can uh, log in using your credentials in order to use Swan and the Jupyter environment that Malcolm used um, uh, today. So feel free to ask any questions or um, in the Q&A or in the, um, in the chat. So uh, also to let you know that we're happy to share the, um, the data sets and the script that just Malcolm developed here with all the attendees. Um, I have a few questions here. So one is for the data set. So yes, they're gonna be available and we're gonna send it to you um, by mail. The one that you joined this webinar. Uh, I have another um, question here. Most data analyses have the time series starting at 100 cases. Can you use Pandas or DeepLayer to transpose the Y axis like that? Uh, so yes, um, you can. Um, so what you need to, what the step here is that you've got a set of reference times. So like when did each country um, first have the, those 100 cases or 30 cases or you know, whatever value you want. Um, and so we need to do a similar, a similar sequence um, as, um, as we've done in the, the group bios. They're a good example here. Um, so just like we grouped by um, the date and the country uh, to get a, um, well, to combine all those values together and sum them, um, we can also group by the data set and apply, instead of a, a sum aggregation, uh, we can apply a, um, a function that uh, uh, compares the, the current date um, to that date that that particular country um, 
went over those those hundred cases. Um, so it is, uh, yeah, it's a relatively easy um, thing to do, um, but it's a sort of a little bit more complicated than I could cover um, here. So I have a few more questions here. Uh, how do you extract data from raster stacks and show bubble plot per country of case numbers? Uh, so if we want to, so to to display a, uh, a bubble plot of case numbers, right, you're looking at um, a single years or a single days um, worth of data or the last. Um, so what we'd want to do um, is to select only that final value uh, or final date. Uh, and then for a bubble plot, uh, we can break it up into the, the different elements. Uh, so um, each on the like X axis, you could have each country. Uh, and then on the, um, or you could, have a, you could have the date and then the Y could be the, the country uh, and then the, you know, color by consonant, and then the size of that bubble could be the number of, of cases there. Um, so that's that's how you can do that. Thanks, Malcolm. A lot of questions coming. Um, another one I have they have here is you mentioned that you usually use preferred Python instead of R. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm kidding. Can you explain the advantages uh, disadvantages of each package? I've only used R. So yeah. So I think. For straight data analysis and visualization, um, so kind of like what we've done here, um, I'd say that R is actually a better uh, fit for that. Uh, and some of the, the manipulations that we're doing, it, it's really um, quite logical. Um, however, very rarely is just the this sort of manipulation the entire research project. Um, often you'll have um, you know data capture and other um, analysis and statistical tools that you'll use. Uh, and so in those cases, using you know, what's within the field uh, commonly used is sort of the, the best approach there. Um, one case um, where, well, so that's sort of why I was using Python because it was used more within the field. Um, one case where Python is distinctly better is working with text data. Um, so if that's part of your um, processing, then Python is a, probably a better choice there. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, another question we have here: Why did you use uh, you didn't use the and the person symbol to combine two criteria in our select? Uh, because that was another thing to explain, and um, also to introduce the idea of the the pipelines. Um, so yeah, that's sort of motivating example to um, show how we can use the pipelines. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, could you please advise what the time period of the COVID data set is? Does the GitHub link provide the, Git, the COVID-19 from January 2020? Um, I'm not sure. I'll put the GitHub link in the chat um, so that you know, if I copy it properly, um, so that you can um, uh, yeah, investigate it. I think, actually, if I um, select the um, minimum value, um, so query um, what date equals um, the date dot min, uh, it goes from the 22nd of January. Perfect. Um, a few more questions and then I think we can finalize this. Uh, can we use Lattice package here for R? Uh, the which package? The Lattice. Lattice. Yep. Uh, I'm not aware of the Lattice package. Uh, Anastasios, you may be able to answer that one. Yeah, I would do with that. I'm using dplyr and tidyverse all the time. So for me, it's much easier. But if you're feeling more comfortable with other packages, then definitely. Um, I haven't used it that much. So I don't know the advantages and disadvantages between dplyr and uh, Lattice. So yeah. 
Uh, if I can just jump in here, I just had a quick look at the lattice package and it looks like it's something that could be replicated with facet wrap in ggplot, where you could facet wrap by a country, for example, or continent, if that's what you wanted to do for your visualization. Oh, it's for the visualization. I thought like it's to replicate there. Well, okay. Um, also, can we simply ignore the warning messages from R as I saw some warning messages in the illustration? <laughs> that's a really good question, actually. Um, yeah, so sometimes you can. Um, it's always a good idea to read them. Um, I ignored them here. Um, so this particular removed 201 rows containing missing values. Um, so that's just saying that there were some missing values uh, in the, the data set that I gave. Uh, and so it, um, ggplot was, hey, I've omitted them and I'm making you aware that I've omitted them. Um, and then this other one is there's zero values. Um, so when we transform, take a log of zero, you get um, not a number, or in this case, I think it's inf. Um, so that's, that's what that message is there. Um, so typically you want to understand why, because it pro possibly um, identifies a problem with your underlying data set. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Yeah, it's a good point also to mention that that's one of the big advantages of Python compared to R. Um, Python doesn't like warning messages, likes errors, and which is great for people who are beginners because it's not gonna let you run things. On the other hand, R really loves warning messages and would like to give you an answer, even though it's incorrect and give you a warning message. So it's really important in R to read all the warning messages because it may be some hidden errors there as well. So you need to understand actually when to ignore them or not. Um, okay, a few more and then I'm done. There are a lot of questions. Um, uh, I want to use one viewer in my iPad or iPhone. Does Cloud Store have a specific app for working with Jupyter Notebooks? on mobile devices? That's a good question. Have you used any Swan on an iPad or something like that? I'm not sure actually, I haven't used Swan and Cluster in an app. Yeah, um, I know that Shara is here, but if Shara can give a, send us a message in the chat, if she knows, then we can um, provide to everybody. Oh, iPad, yes. So you can use an iPad. Thanks, Sarah. But the, she mentions that the shortcuts doesn't, don't work. Uh, she thinks that, yeah. So you can give it a try in uh, an iPad and see how it's working. Um, I'll have another two questions and then we can finish with this one. Um, is this the standard procedure you would use to analyze this type of data, do you know, do you do any more complicated statistics to extract more information? Um, so this would be the start, right? So going through what, um, where, what I went through at the start, which was the, okay, what columns do I have? Um, what type of data do they have? Um, that's something that you, you want to go through for any data set that you load up. Um, but then, yeah, you definitely want to go into to more depth and understanding um, and it depends on the particular data set. So in this case, um, a lot of people, um, there was the, the question about, you know, starting at 100 cases. Um, so that's sort of a further analysis that you could look at, um, or you could look at, um, you know, daily um, increases. Uh, so that's that's something you could look at there as well. Um, so it's it's, I guess, finding the right questions to ask and then being able to ask those questions about the data um, that's the sort of the, the process, but once you have the data cleaned up, it's much easier to go through those, uh, that question asking process. Okay. One last question here. Uh, what's the difference between learning Python and R is the learning curve greater for, uh, one or the other. I mean, like, I we think so with learning Python, I feel it's, um, very easy to get started um, and to slowly extend yourself. Uh, and there's always, there's always something new. Um, 
and I mean, with R, it's, it's very much the same. Um, they both have, I mean, if you get into really advanced things, they have their problems. Um, but for most of, the, most of the work that you'd be doing in a research context, um, I think they're pretty similar um, in terms of learning them. Uh, it's just knowing the right packages to use, I think is probably the, the biggest um, learning curve. If I can add on this one more thing, uh, I think if you are a really beginner beginner and you want to learn both languages, I think the easiest path is to learn first Python because of the debugging process. So the clear messages that you can have when you're running code. So R is a bit tricky in the beginning. So you can have a lot of uh, outputs with zero or uh, not number values because like it would like to run without giving you a precise output. So it can be challenging in the beginning, but as Malcolm said, after you start learning the, the, two, the packages and the libraries and you're familiar with the basic things, I think it's just a preference on the style and the code. Um, also, this was uh, part of our first webinar um, to explain advantages and disadvantages between the two programming languages. We're gonna release a recording on our website um, soon, hopefully, and we're going to make this recording available as well uh, on our website. Um, please let, them know, let us know if you use this cloud store, the Swan service in iPad. We would like to know like, if it's possible and how this can go. And uh, we're going to share again the, the scripts and the data set with you after um, we finish with this webinar. Thanks a lot for attending and thanks Malcolm and Charlotte for helping and for presenting as well. Uh, have a lovely day and hopefully see you in the next webinar. If you have any questions or you would like to get in touch with us, um, you can always conduct uh, training at intersect.org.au um, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.